that one. Don't you love it? That's a toe-tapping song. It's an old one, but I do love it. I love it when we open with it because it just kind of super energizes the entire service on Sunday morning. When there's some that you open with, you just you just can't sit still. you got to tap with them. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, you guys were, were up and ready to go this morning. Uh, Sherry and Carolyn, Terry, Donna and Ruth all got on there before I got on there. So good morning, you all. I hope you're feeling better, Carolyn. I hope you're doing well. And uh, Terry, we missed you yesterday. We could have had you up there going, I fly away too. So we missed you. Uh, and there's Miss Donna, Miss Ruth, we saw yesterday. Buddy and Julia, God bless you. Thank you for that word about yesterday's message. We've got, I've gotten quite a bit of feedback on it. And uh, uh, I'm just glad God could use what feeble words I might throw out and <coughs> put together. But, uh, you know, it's, it's you know, a lot of truth there. Uh, Miss Pam's there. Uh, everyone, welcome to March. Yes, let's celebrate His grace. There's Charlotte, first thing in the morning. Great for you, Charlotte. And Miss Sue, miss seeing you too, kiddo. And Miss Gloria, we always miss you, but I know you're down the coast and you're not driving all the way up here. Had a good group yesterday morning. We had, uh, I think, uh, uh, there were 22, I think Sherry said, in the service itself. So we're coming back, and people are coming back, and I'm encouraging them, you know, to do that. And uh, I know uh, I talked to somebody the other day, said they had their first shot, they're going to get their second one in March, and they're hoping they can come back when they feel comfortable after they're after the getting their shot and stuff. And I think maybe a lot of people are waiting for that as well. Well... It's good to be here with you all this morning on this Monday morning, and it is bright and sunny like it was yesterday so far, and, and that's a blessing. We spent last week exploring, uh, uh, giving an overlay, an overview of, of John, kind of uh, setting the groundwork for his letters. Uh, last week, then, we moved into exploring the prologue in his first letter, and that takes up the first four verses. So we spent uh, you know, a lot of time there yet last week. Uh, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifest, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. Uh, we beheld his glory, John says in his first, uh, in his gospel, in the first chapter, 
we beheld his glory, the glory of the first uh, uh, of the only begotten of God, full of grace and full of truth. But then he says, we have seen and heard him, and uh, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too will have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. We're going to pick up there this morning. Uh, John's laid the foundation for the authenticity of Christ, uh, both as human and divine, and his own credibility as an apostle who had heard, seen, examined, and touched the living Christ. Uh, these are important factors because remember not only is he building up the believer but he's refuting the heresy of the day much of which we you and I have have to confront with in our day he establishes himself as an eye and ear witness to the historically accurate and authentic message of Jesus Christ from there we move to an understanding of the certainty of our fellowship with God and with other believers. And that's where we're going to pick up and and uh, move on through much of this week as we get through the first chapter of John here. And hopefully by the end of the week, moving in to the second chapter as well. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for the blessing of sharing with my brothers and sisters here on this morning. I thank you for that privilege, Lord, and it is. And I pray, Lord, that in no way at any time would I take for granted uh, the, the blessings of, of, of being able to share with people the good news of Jesus Christ, the, uh, uh, the letters, the gospels, the whole counsel of Almighty God. We thank you. We love you. And I ask you, Lord, to teach us and be our director through this uh, uh, this time this morning. Let me just simply be a facilitator, and Lord, you teach us. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me uh, get my eyes focusing a little better this morning and looking a little better. Uh, he knows, he, John wants us to understand what the nature of true fellowship is. Uh, because that's something, too, that was being distorted by uh, the Gnostics, the, the false teachers, uh, uh, that, that it were infiltrating the church in that day uh, by the end of the first century. Remember, this is uh, very close to the end of John's life. Uh, he's writing either in Ephesus before he is uh, uh, exiled to the Isle of Patmos in AD 96, or he wrote them somewhere between that time and the time of his death. But we do know that he's writing and he's getting these letters primarily to his audience in Ephesus, and then those letters are going to be circulated throughout that region, as we looked at uh, earlier last week. He, he lays out for us that true fellowship with one another and with God is really the basis of, of the fullness of what true, authentic joy is all about. Fellowship simply means, as we've shared, that word koinonia means to share in common. Uh, and in particular, as we're talking about Christian fellowship here, it is uh, not just sharing in common uh, a, uh, a philosophy or sharing in common a national heritage sort of thing. No, uh, though that is, you know, that's fellowship in, in other writings and other ways. It, it can, uh, we, we share in common a common goal or a, a common work or a common ethic, that sort of thing. But specifically what John is speaking here is the fact that you and I share a common life. And of course that life is Jesus Christ. We share in that same divine life. So that when we come to God in faith, you know, through faith in, uh, you know, faith, uh, in Christ, we can be assured that uh, we have true, uh, uh, honest fellowship. So our true fellowship is a certainty. It's something we can be certain about. We don't have to question. You know, the I, I tell people, you know, several times when uh, they have come to me and say, "Well, yeah, I just don't feel comfortable here, comfortable there. I just don't feel like I'm I'm having any you know real you know fellowship." And I tell them, "You have, if you are a child of God, you have fellowship with other believers. That's just you know that comes." 
with the territory. We share in common the life of Christ. The question is, are we enjoying what we have? Do we enjoy the fellowship that we have both with God and with other believers? Uh, there is such a joy, you know, uh, when we come together. There's a joy here, but, you know, we're sharing in long distance this, this commonality, this life that we hold in common. And I enjoy it. I love seeing the notes that you put up there. I love seeing your names pop up there. I love seeing the afterthoughts and the emails and the different things that people say and do. That, that, that brings great joy to my heart. But when we come together, and you know this to be a fact, uh, when we come together, uh, there is something that just absolutely uh, comes alive, and that's what happens in fellowship. You know, I can give you a good example, and uh, I, I don't want Buddy and Julia to get embarrassed, but uh, uh, just to share how, how that works. It worked in my life. A few years back when I had uh, my surgery for cancer, uh, I'm I'm in that little room with the curtains drawn and everything, and and uh, people have come to pray, and the kids were there, and Sherry was there, and everything, and pretty soon there was a knock knock on the curtain. They opened the curtain, and there stood Buddy and Julia. They'd flown all the way from Florida out there to be there that day, and I was absolutely overwhelmed. The sense of fellowship and love and joy that uh, you know filled here was here were people in my church family that were there that were here supporting my family, and here was some other family members that had come from such a great distance to share in that joy and to support my family. Uh, you can't get away from that, folks. That's true, true fellowship. And that's what we're talking about. That's what John is talking about. And how many of us out here, you that are there, you can pop on and, and say, I have, I have, I have experienced exactly what I'm sharing here. True, honest sharing of a life together in Christ that brings such great joy. Well, John writes in that fourth verse at the end of his, his prologue, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. You see, knowing Christ, fellowshipping with God and God's people brings us a fullness or a completeness of joy that is really hard to, to describe because it's such an overwhelming thing. It is joy abundant and overflowing. Uh, we had a couple that's been visiting and they're just going to settle in. They, they love being apart and uh, uh, I believe they'll probably end up even you know, officially you know, joining in this body as we, we talk to them further. But they have come out yesterday saying, we so love what we have here. Wow. That's quite a statement from this couple. They said, it's been so long since we've had this. We so love what we have here. We love the worship. We love the message. We love what's going on here. That's an experience of true joy that comes from true fellowship. The idea that we, who are so defiled by sin, could have fellowship, could share together the very life of Christ, share with the Holy God, not just for a few years here on earth, but forever, for eternity, should overwhelm us. Jesus says, tells us that, you know, plainly that, that as we looked at yesterday, kind of rushed over it, but where your treasure is, there your heart is also. When you and I really perceive what true fellowship is with God, we become satisfied with Him. Is He our treasure? Do we treasure him? Are we satisfied in him alone? When that, when that happens, we, we, we are weaned away. We begin to cease to burn with, with some sort of desire for other things. Listen to the words of David, a man after God's own heart. Ah, uh, yeah, how amazing is that? It is. David says in, in Psalm 16, The Lord is my chosen portion, my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Well, it's not too unsimilar to what Paul 
says in his own testimony in Philippians 3. In verse 8 he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss, but for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He considered everything else nothing more than, than dung on the side of the road in comparison to having this kind of knowledge, this kind of fellowship with Almighty God. There is no greater treasure in the heart of David or Paul than the relationship and fellowship that they had with God. Everything else paled in comparison. So simply ask yourself, what's your greatest treasure? What's your greatest joy? You see, when I look out and, and, and I, 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 I look out on Sunday and I see the ground, I, I see faces where people normally sit when they're there. And, and I miss seeing them. Why? Because we're family. It was a joy to me to look up there Sunday and see my youngest granddaughter. Uh, she's here visiting right now. They'll be, she'll be moving back uh, and coming back, but uh, uh, here, you know, not too long from now. But she came up to visit and help, you know, Kirk out right now since uh, she's going to work in the shop a little bit, so he can be uh, ready to go down to his dad's. He's got a cold right now, so he can't do that. But uh, he needs to go down and see his dad. It was a joy. Oh, and you see, every week I look out there and I see where she normally would have sat on a Sunday. And, uh, but you see, that's family. Is it Christ that's your greatest joy? Or are you still searching? Not thoroughly content with your communion with Christ. We're entering into the section in 1 John where John's going to emphasize our fellowship with God and one another uh, most, uh, you know, that, and, and that's going, by the way, that's going to spread out through the rest of this letter that he's written. He's laying these foundations in the first chapter. Listen to what he says in, in, in f verses 5 through 7. This is the message that we have, that we heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Well, not only is, is, is true fellowship a certainty when you come to Christ, but he says that uh, there's a way that we enjoy this fellowship. And this is what he's getting to. Uh, you see, because true fellowship is pervasive. Uh, it penetrates. Look at what Paul says. He says, this is the message that we heard uh, from him and proclaimed to you, what? That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You see, light is per pervasive. Light penetrates gets to even the deepest i've been i've been down in caves i've been down in in my and i gotta tell you there is still light light penetrates it has a way of filtering in even to the darkest places god is light and in him is no darkness at all now this is an important statement because contrary to Gnostic philosophy or the kind of new Gnostic philosophy that runs around today, uh, which says that higher enlightenment, this kind of, of deep understanding of God is not possible for everybody, only for a select few who are in on the secret knowledge. Or and that, that, that Jesus could not have come in the flesh at all. Uh, that uh, he was a man and, and that discovered his own divinity within him. John says not only did Jesus come in the flesh, but that he is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now in saying this, he's not only contradicting Gnostic philosophy, but he's also taking a stab at the way the Gnostics lived. You see, this light is available to all. I mean, it's 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 like going out in the noonday sun. It's not you know it, it's it's not just for a few people to get the sun rays. Everybody can get it, 
if they'll receive it, everybody can know him and everybody can live in light even as he is in the light. So, so long as they, uh, you see, they believe that, that all matter was evil. And many of them claim that they could do anything they wanted in the flesh because uh, flesh was, after all, evil, and it's going to do what flesh does, and it doesn't involve the enlightenment of the spirit. And so long as they didn't affect their spirit as it is, they had no problem with any manner of sin. Now, consider how this truth runs in the face of postmodernism, which says there is no absolute truth. That you, there, there is no truth, so therefore truth is whatever you want it to be. John is saying that God is absolutely light, absolute light, full light. In him there's no darkness. He's making an absolute statement about the nature of God one that would be rejected by our postmodern culture. In essence, John is saying, contrary to what others may say God is, God is light. In him is no darkness, no matter what they say. Whatsoever, you cannot practice evil done in darkness and still walk in light, because there is no darkness in him at all. Now, if you're going to practice evil, if you're going to walk in darkness, then he says you're not living in light. You cannot practice evil, you cannot walk in darkness, and still walk in light. Now that having been said, if you have fellowship with him, you will not walk in darkness, but you will walk in light as he is in the light. In other words, fellowship with God means that there has been a substantive and sustained change in the way you live. Does that not mean that you will never sin, that you will never do a deed of darkness again? No, that's not what he said. There were then, like today, many who claim to be in fellowship with God, but whose lives do not reflect a change of any kind. To those, Paul would say what he says in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. By the way, that word means to be perpetually constant. If we walk and continue to walk, that's the, that's the tense and the way this is built, well, built. If we say we have fellowship with him, Yet we walk and continue to walk and continue to walk and continue to walk. Our, path, our, our lifestyle, our pattern of living is walking in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. Those who truly have fellowship with God are, are readily noticeable by the change in their life. Those who claim to be in fellowship with him and, and, and their lifestyle hasn't changed whatsoever. They continue to live in the same way they lived before they came to know Christ. They continue to walk in darkness. They continue to live like the rest of the world. He says they're liars. They're not practicing the truth. Now, I'm not saying that God is. Oh, you say, oh, John did. Well, John's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's a message that, that God wants to penetrate into our hearts. The fellowship we have with God is pervasive. It penetrates us, changes us at the very core level and manifests itself in every facet of our life. When we have true fellowship with God, when we have come to him in faith and been saved by grace, God changes us at the most basic level, <coughs> if you will, at the molecular level. He changes our very spiritual DNA. We are entirely new creations. The old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new, Paul tells us. Take time to look at, at, at the character of fellowship. You see, true fellowship is one with one another is based on true fellowship with God. This is why we have fellowship. 
we have it the moment we come into relationship with God we have that same fellowship with every other believer every other person that has come to fellowship with God now I would have thought that the first thing John would have laid down uh, is the foundation of our fellowship with God is then to show that our fellowship with one another is 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 the fruit of this greater fellowship why do I have fellowship with with Terry and Gloria and 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 and, and Sue and Charlotte and Sherry and Pam and Buddy and Julia and Ruth and Donna and Carolyn and Terry why do I have fellowship with these people because first I have fellowship with God and first you had fellowship with God. It is the fruit of the greater fellowship. But John begins where we most often need to begin in our horizontal relationship. The thought of fellowship with the Holy God is a bit more than we can generally fathom since it is in many ways an intangible fellowship. Like I can reach out and shake uh, you know, somebody's hand. I can give them a hug but it's a little hard to do that with God, isn't it? Uh, we can't see God. We can't touch God, we, uh, 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 so to speak. We can talk to him, and he talks to us, but I would doubt many of us have heard his audible voice. On the other hand, we can see those that are around us. We can touch those that are around us. We can audibly hear those that are around us. In short, it's easier to relate to other people than it is to relate to an unseen God. So he begins in his discussion of fellowship on this horizontal level because it's here that we'll begin to understand something about this vertical level of fellowship. You see, it's often in those interpersonal relationships with other believers that we even first come into contact with a very personal God. Would you agree with that? Before you met God, there was some Christian person out there who had fellowship with God that, that, that brought you into fellowship. Often we love to uh, feel like the, the love of others in the church even before we know Christ personally. You know, we've even had unbelievers when they come in and they're, they've not yet accepted Christ enjoy what we enjoy on a level because they enjoy the love and the camaraderie and the friendliness and all of that that comes from true fellowship. And sometimes that's the open door to the heart of an individual. This is especially true of those who've had broken relationships all their life. When people come in and they're broken, they come in and they've been damaged or hurt, rejected in some way, and they feel the overwhelming love of the body. And sometimes that's pretty overwhelming for them. You see, they meet a Christian, they come to church, they feel love, they feel acceptance. It's the first thing that they notice. It's such a new experience that it overwhelms them. And I will be honest, with, with some that I've talked to, it's overwhelmed them to the point that they say, I, I, I don't know how to handle this, and they back off. But the more you love them, the more you show them that that's the normal, that they are loved and accepted, the more they begin to embrace, and the more they open themselves up to God. They learn that the source of this love is, is, is not in the people, but in the fact that these people have come to know a loving God. You know, I had, I had I've had, wherever I have gone in disaster relief or working in, in bad areas or something, you know, people say, why do you do this? And that opens the door to say, listen, because of the great love of God, I have to be here. I've had, I've gone into bad situations in homes and uh, worked with families and had them to say, why is it you do this kind of work? And I can tell them, because first God did a work in my heart. And I've learned to love, and, and, I, and that can't be contained. You see, it gives that great open door, doesn't it? I want you to notice three things about this fellowship with one another. You see, if our fellowship 
with others is not based on our fellowship with God. It really is not authentic Christian fellowship. Although those who are not yet believers might associate with us and should be able to sense the love of Christ, they cannot truly know true fellowship with other believers until they personally come to know Christ by faith. Knowing Christ personally and growing in that relationship is the basis of any true fellowship with others that, that know Christ. Otherwise, we have fellowship. We have fellowship, you know, we, we could be on a sports team with somebody and we have fellowship on, on a level because we have a goal to play the game and win the game and all that stuff. We can have fellowship on a level, but we can never have that deep fellowship that God intends that comes from a relationship with him. After all, koinonia means to share in common. And what we share in common, again, I repeat, is a common life. And that life is Christ. That's why uh, it, it, within partnerships or marriages or whatever, when two believers, they can have, they can have this commonality, this fellowship on all levels mental, emotional, physical, uh, goal-wise, everything, but they can all, they, if they're not both believers, they can't have it at that deepest level. Christ to Christ, spirit to spirit, on this vertical level. Anything less really is not genuine Christian fellowship. I didn't say what fellowship, but it's not Christian fellowship. Sometimes we chat with one another about sports or, or, or the news or whatever, and, and uh, uh, we share a snack or a meal or a cup of coffee and say, walk away and say, well, we had fellowship. Well, we had a certain kind of fellowship, but where was Christ in all of that? I read something by J. Vernon McGee, and, and my mother loved him, and I got a lot of stuff that, uh, that he wrote, and, and he a great guy, great, great Bible teacher. But he once spoke at a Rotary Club where uh, the banner said, fun, food, fun, and fellowship, I believe. Well, he began to uh, uh, quip that the food was nothing to brag about, embalmed chicken and peas. He said the fun was a few corny jokes. The fellowship consisted of one man patting another man on the back and saying, hey, Bill, how's business or how's your wife? That was their idea of fellowship. And I think that's many times people's concept of fellowship. Well, we're going to have a fellowship potluck, or we're going to have a fellowship this, or a fellowship that. And uh, that is a level of fellowship. But he goes on to say that Christian fellowship often isn't very different than the Rotary Club. He says we get together for a potluck and we talk about everything under the sun except what should provide true fellowship, and namely all that we share together in Christ. True fellowship centers in, in, in our fellowship with God. Uh, the second thing is the foundation of our fellowship eh, the foundation I had a hard time getting a click. The foundation of our Christian unity is based on our fellowship with God and leads to true fellowship with one another. Now, John didn't advocate a fellowship with heretics, fellowship with these false teachers. These men, no doubt, still claim to believe in Jesus, but just not in the same way that the apostles understood. And even though John emphasizes love, he never encourages love and fellowship with these heretics. Now, we need to love the enemy, but not embracing them as brothers. Quite the opposite. He makes it clear that we should not welcome them even with warm greeting. To do so is to participate in their evil deeds, in, 
In his second letter, he validates this you know, by saying in verses 10 and 11, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, what we've been teaching, the, 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 the whole counsel of God, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, do not receive him into your house or even give him a greeting for whatever gre whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. In other words, you're, you're agreeing, you're assenting by, by receiving them and, and giving them some prominence, you're acquiescent to their belief. There's a lot of sloppy thinking in Christian circles about the subject of unity in Christ. And clearly it's an important topic. Jesus prayed that followers would be one so that the world would know that the Father had sent him. Those trying to promote unity say the world will know that we follow Jesus by our love, not by our doctrine. So they say let's come together in areas that we agree and set aside matters that we disagree. I think that John would disagree with that philosophy. You see, true Christian unity must be based on true fellowship with God, which must be based on faith in the gospel of salvation by grace, alone through, through Christ alone, in faith alone. It's extremely difficult to have true Christian fellowship with those who reject the gospel as handed, uh, handed to us by the apostles and Holy Scripture. When a person or a church denies they are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, how can we have fellowship that leads to unity? Doesn't Amos tell us in Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together unless they agree? In Ephesians 4, Paul mentions two kinds of unity. He says, he, he, he says in, in, four, in chapter 4, verse 3, he said, Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit already exists. We must preserve it. You understand that? We have it. He said, well, we don't feel very unity. Well, we may not be working at preserving it. You understand what I'm saying? That's our job is to work to preserve what we have. But he goes on to say in verse 13 of that chapter, he says, until we all t attain to the unity of faith in the knowledge of the Son of God. Now the unity of faith is something we attain to as we grow to know Christ better through the study of his word, through the teaching, through the fellowshipping of believers. We grow to attain this unity of faith. When you know Christ, you experience genuine unity and fellowship with other Christians, even though there may be significant differences in background, personality, social status, or race. We're not always going to agree on everything. We just won't. We're different. And that's okay. We celebrate unity in the midst of great diversity. Among the apostles, you had Simon the Zealot, who was a, of a, part of a radical political group whose hobby was killing tax collectors. Okay? Now, Matthew was a tax collector. Think about that one. Think about some of the discussions they had around the dinner table. But Jesus brought them together and said, Love one another. Listen, it's perfectly reasonable to think that there's going to be people on this side or this side of any issue. And that's okay. We celebrate unity in the midst of great diversity. So true Christian unity at the basic level consists of a of a, in mutually knowing Christ through the gospel and such unity deepens as we grow to know him better through his word. Well, that brings us to a conclusion this morning. Listen, people, when you have a philosophy that says everybody needs to look alike, think alike, uh, have the same views in, in various areas of politics or whatever, and you're forcing, in the name of unity, this conformity to one you know, style, you have uniformity. 
you don't have unity. Unity accepts the differences in all of us and celebrates them. I think it would be a pretty bland world if everybody thought like I thought and held the same opinions that I held on everything. Because sometimes I can be wrong. So we look at the thumb and we look at the ear. Can you tell me what similarity the thumb has to the ear? Would I want to go without either one of them? No. You see, there's great diversity in our body. But it is such a magnificent unity. That's the way it is in the church. Such beautiful, beautiful diversity brought together in incredible unity. How? Because of one life. We share on this horizontal level because we have such connection on the vertical. Unity with one another, fellowship with one another, is the fruit of unity and fellowship with God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to open up your word and let it speak to us today. And I pray, Father, that we will take this word and really celebrate it. That, Lord, you will be our ultimate treasure today. That you are the greatest value to us today. And, Lord, as we said yesterday, today is the day you've given us. Tomorrow's another day, but this is the day. This is the day that we say, okay, everything else gets swept aside except you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us this incredible life that you've given us. Thank you for our fellowship one with the other. Lord, thank you for our fellowship with you. Lord, take us through this day, guiding us in paths that we have not yet walked. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Remember, you haven't walked this way before, so keep your eyes on him. Keep your ears open on his frequency and live for him today. God bless you. I'll see you in the morning at 9 o'clock as we pick up here and keep moving on forward. God bless. Find somebody you can love and share with today. Have a great day.